Today's scripture reading passage is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verses 1 to 8. Um, verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently, O oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Martin, for reading the word of God for us this afternoon. And a very good afternoon to every one of you. So happy to see so many of you come for this worship today. Today we gather here to celebrate our 39th uh, church anniversary. Like in all birthday or wedding anniversary celebration, we recall, we recall and thank God for his goodness and mercy. Because we know that our lives are in God's hands, right? Therefore, it is right for us to thank God for what he has done for us and entrust the year ahead unto him. So what should we thank God for at this anniversary? Just now I asked uh, those who came early to think about that. As I was, uh, as I, as I, waited upon the Lord, he impressed upon my heart that we should be thankful for his word, the Bible. As I recall the 12 years of life in TCEPC, we have been greatly blessed by the faithful preaching and teaching of the Bible book by book. And in recent months, still fresh in my mind, are the precious lessons that we learned together about the true and false Christianity from 1 John and the spiritual downfalls in the topical sermon series. It has become very clear to me that over the years, TCPC has grown and will continue to grow to be more and more mature spiritually i truly thank god for the love for god's word among the leaders who labor alongside me the past 12 years especially this gentleman uh, on the screen when we present a Bible to everyone in the church 12 years ago, if you remember. I asked him to be the model, to hold the Bible so that I can use it to encourage the church to hold the Bible close, watch carefully, close to their hearts and live joyfully. As it turns out, he is indeed the model in real life. He loves God. And his, and his word dearly. I can become emotional when I talk about this. He will sit with you and talk with the Bible. One to one or in a small group, anytime and anywhere. Right? This is because he is fully convinced that the word of God can stimulate us and inspire our faith. He believes 
that the word of God brings clarity and understanding in times of perplexity and confusion. The word of God brings the message of peace so that we will not be easily troubled by the various voices of fear and despair around us. Indeed, we need more people like Preacher Chi Hong in the church today. Especially when the world we live has become more and more distant from the word of God. People in general are not interested in ancient temple, priests, and animal sacrifices. Or even a man called Jesus died on the cross for their sins to secure their eternal future. They are more interested in the here and now. How to make more money and live comfortably. While many people reject the word of God, some would even turn hostile against God's word that speaks against their sins. On the other hand, Christians are in real danger of falling away too. As we have read in the responsive reading just now, where Apostle Paul warned us that the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching of God's word and will turn to something that suits their own interests and wander away from the true faith to embrace what is untrue and do wrong in the sight of God. It will be a disaster if Christians do not love God's word because they will not be equipped to do good work and the church will cease to be the sword and the light of the world. In my fellowship with the senior minister of other EP churches last week, one of them shared that the percentage of practicing Bible-believing Christian in UK, United Kingdom, which is a Christian country, you know how many percent? That's it, not 50, 5. 5%. Five no wonder there are so many empty churches, church building in UK. Now, how about in Singapore? Will this happen to the churches in Singapore? The answer is yes. It was reported that Singapore churches have stopped growing, listen, in the past 10 years. If the trend continues, it will certainly go the UK way. This is indeed a challenging time. Now that is why I have chosen Psalm 119 to exhort us today on the 39th anniversary. And this is likely to be my last exhortation as your senior minister at church anniversary. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible and it talks about nothing but the Bible. With 176 verses, the author of Psalm 119 tells us the many blessings in obeying God's word. Instead of drowning himself with sorrow and self-pity in challenging times, the psalmist shows us the power of God's word. God's word keeping him alive and stay above all the challenges in his life. Psalm 119 is also called the Mount Everest of all Psalms. If you have read the whole Psalm, Psalm 119, actually I ask you to read through three times. How many of you have done so? How many of you have done so? Well done. That's one. Okay, if you have done so, you will come across words like God's law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, promises, judgment, and even God's ways, God's name, or simply God's word. The meaning of these words are actually overlapping with one another. 
So the author uses this word to collectively reveal to us God, who God is, and our relationship with Him and His Word. Today, we will focus on just the first eight verses, which is the introduction to Psalms 119. It tells us the blessed conduct, listen carefully, the blessed conduct of obeying God's word is commanded by our supreme and holy God. And it demands our sacred commitment to live in this blessed conduct. And I have outlined the sermon in three C's. A blessed conduct in verse 1 to 3, a supreme command in verse number 4, and a sacred commitment verses 5 to 8. But we, before we unpack the eight verses, let us pray. Father, please speak to us today and cause us to hear and love what you say so that we may be led to walk in your holy ways. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. Let's begin with a blessed conduct, verse 1 to 3. The first C. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. The psalmist begin by declaring that whoever obey God's word is blessed. A lifestyle of obeying God's word is blameless and blessed. Blameless means do no wrong, unashamed, un defar, perfect and complete as they wholly conform to the instruction of God and they have peace with God and man. Isn't it a tremendous blessing from God? The psalmist is pronouncing the certainty, listen carefully, the certainty of an objective reality, not a subjective emotional response to the blessing of God. This is not pronouncing wishes for happiness upon the people or dangling a reward for acts of obedience or good conduct. So the people will have to try to receive, try hard to receive the reward. But an objective blessing to those who live in conformity to God's instructions. Now it reminds us of the word blessed in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scoffer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. The psalmist is referring to certain people who are the object of God's blessings because they love and they obey the law of God. As they follow God's instructions in their conduct of life, they are confident that God is pleased and things will go well. For example, when husband and wife arrange their marriage to reflect God's design for marriage, it is a good marriage. And they are objectively blessed because of it. So as we see in these three verses, Christians are blameless when they walk, when they keep, and when they seek God. Christians are blessed even when they suffer for obeying what God has instructed. Look, Jesus make it clear what is blessed in the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, just an example. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs 
is the kingdom of heaven. When are they blessed? When they are persecuted for doing the right thing in the sight of God. One more important thing for us to take note in this declaration is found in verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him, seek God, with their whole heart. The blessed seek God with all their hearts, meaning they do not just look at what God has said and then move on, but to observe, to keep and to obey God's word without compromise and with great determination and courage. In other words, they set their hearts to know the God of the word, not just the word of God. Not going for the cold, so-called cold knowledge about the Bible, but go for the warm relationship with the Heavenly Father. Remember what we have learned recently? Taught to us by our preacher about biblical blessing. What is biblical blessing? Biblical blessing is living in harmony with God. In other words, obeying God's word, aligning our lives with the instructions of God is itself a blessing. So remember, being blessed is an objective reality, not a subjective response. It is not doing something and be rewarded. We do not attend church regularly. And by doing so, we hope, we hope that God will treat us favorably. Come to church to worship God is a blessing itself. So all of us here are blessed because we come and worship God. God will be pleased. And here in Psalm 119, the psalmist give us a long list of blessings from God's word in a form of prayer, as you can see from verse 9 all the way to the end of the Psalm 119. There are really too many blessings to list all of them. So let us take a look at a few Example. The first example, God's word lead us to the blessing of love for God. Verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We are what is in our heart. Isn't that true? When our hearts are filled with God's word, we will be transformed to love God instead of loving sins or idol. Joy in God. Verse 171. My lips will pour forth praise for you teach me your statute. Learning God's word brings joy in God. And this joy is true joy in life. Reverence for God. Verse 120. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgment. God's holy judgment will cause us to worship him reverentially superior knowledge verse 99 i have more listen carefully i have more understanding than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditations the word of god offers much more and more superior knowledge and wisdom than all the gurus, so-called, in the world 
can offer us freedom. Verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than what? Than thousands of gold and silver pieces. God's word has the power to set us free from the shackle of money and of wealth. Perseverance. Verse 87. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. With the word of God, we can persevere. We can persevere in challenging time and we can hold steady without giving up. Even our life is threatened. Life, verse 40, Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. In our struggle with death, life, eternal life, is found in God's word. And just one more. That's not enough for the screen. Right living, verse 104. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You see, God's words give us the wisdom and strength to do what is right and stay true to God and to people around us. As we can see from what the psalmist of Psalm 119 has listed for us, the word of God never fails to stimulate us and inspires our faith. God's words bring clarity and understanding in times of perplexity and confusion. We will find the word of God, the source of strength and wisdom, and we will learn the grace that transforms us. Therefore, we have peace in God to live victoriously. We will not be easily troubled by the various voices of fear and despair around us and we will come away delighted in God and his word responding to all situations with confidence we will be optimistic in other words instead of pessimistic about life and future there are these are the blessings when we study and obey God's word Is this your experience? We have been here for 12 years. Can you call yourself blessed today? Is your lifestyle a blameless lifestyle? Do you have peace with God and man? Is the word of God, the Bible, your daily Daily bread that sustain and strengthen your life. Is Bible reading a dread or a delight to you? Daily beloved, would you decide now to love the word of God? Like the psalmist of 119. Well, if you are still struggling with the decision, let the psalmist of Psalm 119 help you. After declaring that those who obey God's word are blessed and blameless, the psalmist says in verse number 4, You, that means God, has commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Why would God command his people to obey his word? when it is a blessing to have his word and to obey the word. Now, there are two intended messages in commanding us to obey here. First, very straightforward, right? Obey God's word. This is a command. And be blessed or suffer the consequences. Two, it is another way 
of saying I love you. And I really want to bless you. Here we see God's zeal to bless his children is amplified by the words to keep diligently. It means to obey God's word all the time. Seriously, not casually, not occasionally, because God wants his children to be fully blessed. It is God's glory when his children are called the blessed. Obedient children. We must also remember that our God did not whisper his instructions to us, but have them written down so that we might carefully and diligently study them and obey them and be blessed. When we sin as Christians, it is only because we are not fixing our, our eyes on the commands of God. God's precepts is like the step-by-step -step instruction, like the instruction to set up the furniture we bought from Ikea. We know that something is wrong when we realize that there is still a piece left after fixing the furniture. When that happens, what do we do? We need to re-examine the instruction, isn't it? God's instruction is precise in language, not a loud revision or alteration. For example, marriage is, according to the word of God, is for one man and one woman. Husband, love your wife, and wife, submit to your husband. Children, honor your parents. They are not general guidelines to be followed at our own convenience. Just like God's word that created the universe. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Let there be lands, be seas, be plants, and let us make man and woman, and so on. And then in verse 31, And God saw, after saying all the words, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was a very good creation according to what God has commanded. So God command us to obey his word diligently is supreme. Then it is supremely good. Thanks be to God for giving us such a command. Since God has commanded that we should keep his precept diligently and therefore be perfectly blessed, what should be our response? In the following verses, verse 5 to 8, the psalmist responds in a heartfelt prayer of commitment. The psalmist commit himself to obey God's word steadfastly and even plead to God not to utterly forsake him. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rule, I will keep your statute. Do, do not, please do not utterly forsake me. There are two very important elements in this prayer of commitment. The first is that this is a sacred commitment, not a casual prayer. It is a sacred commitment to steadfastly obey God's word so that the psalmist will not be put to shame, so that his life is blessed as God has intended. He wants that. Yes, Lord, since you have commanded, I will take it. I do not want to be put to shame. Do you know that for the, to the ancient Jew, uh, Hebrews, to be put to shame, is worse than death. So it is not a casual understanding, undertaking, but a secret commitment. It is like a marriage vow taken by a wedding couple to do their part in loving and submitting to each other. 
as God has intended and instructed. Notice that to obey God's word steadfastly, the psalmist need to have his eyes fixed on all the commandment of God. Not some of the commandment, but all the commandments of God. The second observation is that the psalmist needs God's help to keep his commandment. In verse 5, the psalmist pray that all oh, my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. This is a plea for God to establish his life for a single purpose. What is that? To keep God's statutes. The psalmist knows that he alone will not be able to fulfill his holy desire to steadfastly obeying God's word. He needs first to fix his eyes on God's words and God has to teach him so that he can learn from the word of God and then obey. As we see in verse 7, I shall give thanks to you with an uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. The psalmist needs an able teacher in God so that he can learn God's instruction to live the right way. And the teacher must not give him up when he did not learn well or learn quick enough. As we see in verse number 8, when he prays, do not utterly forsake me. Now this reminds me of the time when I asked my daughter to teach me how to follow the instruction to download certain apps to obtain a vaccination certificate so that I can travel to Batam for Synod Exco uh, retreat next week, or rather this week. You now it may sound very simple to some of you, but <laughs> being unfamiliar with such instructions, uh, I was understandably apprehensive la, and nervous. I need help. And I thank God that my daughter did not give me up. <clears throat> we can see that the desire of the psalmist to have God's help, to follow God's regulation, is born out of his commitment to live a blameless and blessed life, mentioned in verse 1 and 2. Now, if he has been able to obey with the help of God, listen, then he will never be accused or blamed of failure to do what is required, isn't it? Uh, not very savvy, that's why. Uh... <laughs> Okay, coming up. The psalmist needs God's help. As I was saying that if the psalmist has been able, has been enabled to obey with the help of God, then he will never be accused of failure to do what is required of God. If I am able to produce my vaccination certificate, I will not be rejected at the Indonesian immigration. I will be seen as meeting the requirement as instructed. When I have fully, when I have finally printed the hard copy of the certificate, I was very relieved and thankful. So the psalmist in verse 7, give thanks to God with an upright heart, he said, when he has learned God's righteous rule. An upright heart is a joyful heart that will do the right thing. In this case, the psalmist has good reason to be thankful to God and his instruction that bring him 
to the blessing of obeying. When a student, in the same manner, when a student has learned a subject well, listen, to whom he should give thanks. Martin, answer. <laughs> Both the subject he studied and the teachers who taught him. Right? Right? So likewise, we should be thankful to the Bible and the Holy Spirit who taught us. Therefore, reading God's word is a supernatural experience. Because we are taught by God the Spirit and being transformed in the process. We see it here in verse number 8, when the psalmist has experienced the profound joy of understanding the depths and the heights of God's word, he doesn't, he doesn't want to see that this blessing be taken away from him. So he pleaded with God not to utterly forsake him. It means not to give him up when he fails at a certain point. A true Christian will see himself undone if God forsake him. It will be utterly hopeless if he is to be left alone to face a world full of evil temptation. So he prays, do not utterly forsake me. It also carried the plea for patience. Please give me more time. I want to keep trusting and obeying you and hoping that you will help me out. Please stick to me. Sometimes when we struggle with sin and suffering in our lives, we may feel that God has forsaken us and we can't find the Find a way out. So what should we do? Follow the example of the Samis. Keep faith and trust his word and promises. In my 46 years of Christian life, there are two examples of faith in God's word in the Bible that really encouraged me. The first example is the flood in Noah's day. Noah obeyed God's instruction to build the ark. And they were safe when the great flood comes. All other people missed the boat and they perished. God's instruction to Noah has provided a way out of death and destruction or Noah and his family. The second example is Abraham sacrificing his only son, Isaac. Now we have studied the book of Genesis and you know what happened on the Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 22. God commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac as a sacrifice Present Isaac as a sacrifice in worship of him. Abraham followed every single instruction given by God. And when Abraham, Isaac, and the two young men arrived at Mount Moriah, Abraham told the two young men to stay where they are. Then Abraham said to, the, to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. How did Abraham know that he and his son Isaac will come back? He knows the instruction very well and he's going to follow. So when his son Isaac asked him, Dad, where is the lamb for burnt offering? This is what Abraham said. God will provide. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And we know that God did provide. God did provide a sacrificial lamb for burnt offering and Isaac's life was spared. Abraham and Isaac 
did go back to the two young men. The way in which Abraham obeyed God's instruction never failed to amaze me. He knows very well that Isaac will die. And he will have no more descendants if he follow exactly what God has instructed him. What is the secret? Let's see what the book of Hebrews says about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He, Abraham, listen carefully, considered that God was able even to raise him, which is Isaac, from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In other words, Isaac supposed to die, but now he's alive. With the intervention of God. The author of Hebrews tells us what is in the mind of Abraham at the time when he was tested. Abraham believes, Hebrews tells us, that God will provide a way out for Isaac because he followed his instructions. God will never cause harm to Abraham who followed his instruction diligently. If we trust God and follow his word in times of testing, he will provide a way out. Even death cannot destroy us. We will live again. We will live eternally. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes. So if you have yet to trust God's promise of salvation in and through Jesus Christ, I urge you right now that you do so without delay. God's word is worthy of our trust. So in conclusion, God's blessing is closely related to obeying his word, the Bible. It is God's divine will for Christians to enjoy this special blessing. And therefore, it should be our holy desire to treasure God's word and find delight in obeying his word. Application. I believe TCEPC will survive and thrive if all of us are committed to these three P's. The first P, personal daily devotion. Start your day by reading the Bible, not newspaper. And learn how to read the Bible better. And I recommend this book written by Richard Chin. Very thin, very easy. Few pages only, but it's power packed. It will, it will help you a lot and learn how to grasp God's big picture. I think all of us have this, many of us have this book, we studied together. This is by Juan Roberts, so that we can progress. We must progress from drinking milk to eating solid food. The second P is preach the And out of season, we the instructions of God. Be a good and patient teacher, enduring suffering, Paul told us, so that they can be equipped for good work. As Paul says in our responsive reading, the third P is to put the Bible in the center of all aspects 
of our life, in our marriage, in our family, in our workplace, in our school. If we do so, I hope we will do so. This is my hope and prayer for TCEPC in the years to come. So before we partake the Lord's Supper, I would like us to take a few minutes to reflect how the Word of God has shaped your life, your practice of faith until now, and ask God to help you. He will certainly do if you ask to love his Bible. That you will also end up holding your Bible close to your heart and you smile. Ah. That will be the day that all of us will truly be joyful Christian, the blessed of God. So spend some time now before we start the communion. <laughs>